<laughs> Great. Thanks, Ellen. Good. Well, um, again, thanks for sticking around for the till the bitter end. Um, Okay, well, I think most of the geometers are down the hill, so, you know, let's uh, do some analysis, huh? <laughs> so I promised you nuts and bolts yesterday, and I didn't quite get there, so I want to tell you a little bit about um, what goes on. So let me sort of lay this out in a, uh, uh, a categorical fashion. Sorry, I thought I wasn't going to use that word, but I will. Um, so here is sort of from a, a purely structural point of view what we've been doing. So we have a, uh, so there's both a local and global theory. But, you know, we have a manifold uh, with boundary, uh, manifold with boundary. Uh, and we um, define, so what we're doing from an operator theoretic point of view is we're defining this, uh, uh, this hopefully an algebra, or something close to an algebra of operators, which I'm calling psi zero, and then I'll sort of be write it as star comma star. So there's two adornments here. So the pseudo differential operator order and something else, which I had indicated yesterday, and I'll describe again here. So uh, of M. So this is a space of operators. So this is a set of uh, pseudo differential operators. So psi dos, which are um, uh, exhibiting a certain degeneracy. Okay, so we can model these on. So, you know, you can argue about what's the starting point for this theory, but a starting point is the following. So I'll say V0, which is a space of all C infinity vector fields on M, smooth up to the boundary, which vanish at the boundary. Okay, now if I choose local coordinates, so I'll always use local coordinates uh, x and then y1 through yn minus 1. Then uh, this v0 is the span over c infinity of uh, the vector fields x d by dx, x d by dy, j. j goes from 1 to n minus 1. Okay, so you can sort of take this as sort of the basic structure, this, the set of structure vector fields. And then out of this, we uh, can form what I wrote down yesterday as diff uh, zero star of M, right? This is a space of all uh, operators, L, which are locally of the form V1, Vm, uh, let's say. Uh, let's say Vl. Um, this is over L. Well, you know, this is a locally finite sum. Something like that. So where each of these VJs are in V0. So just sums of combinations, sums of products of these vector fields. So, you know, I wrote down a prototype yesterday. Uh, so if I write down an operator of the form A, J alpha of X and Y, mod, uh, so J plus mod alpha less than or equal to M, X dx to the J, X dy to the alpha using multi-index notation. So this is a typical element in local coordinates of this. So, you know, in this particular world, I'm looking at, at, at operators which degenerate in this particular way. Anytime you differentiate, you're also multiplying by power that by the by a single power of the uh, of the defining function for the boundary. Okay, so you have this class of things, and this psi zero star is meant to be a quantization of this. So this is sort of embedding this in a larger algebra of pseudo differential operators, which morally have exactly the same sort of degeneracy. Okay, now. You can phrase this in various different ways, but what's kind of interesting about these things, so if I take L, and then if I sort of dilate L, so if I let, um, let's say, D sub lambda, X, Y, so I'm choosing a base point, so I'm using local coordinates, I'm sort of fixing a base point as the origin, and I send this to lambda X, lambda Y. Okay, so I just choose that dilation. Then the point about these operators is I can take this sort of a family of operators which, so I don't know, let's pull them back, and you know, I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong. You know, one can figure this out, the privacy of one's own home, right? But if you dilate this, well, these are dilation invariant vector fields. This thing obviously may not be. So this would look like the sum aj alpha of lambda x, lambda y, uh, x dx to the j, x dy to the alpha. 
and as lambda goes to zero, I guess, I've, so I probably have it backwards, this should be d1 over lambda, you know, whatever, but as lambda goes to zero, this is converging to a constant, right? But what's happening is that these operators are not changing very much, they're kind of just behaving uniformly, they're converging smoothly to something. So that's kind of what's the, uh, the cardinal feature of these things, is that they're almost dilation invariant, okay? If I fix any point in the boundary and I dilate from there, then they're almost dilation invariant. Okay, so in some sense, that's the guiding principle of what we want psi zero to look like, pseudo-differential operators, which are almost dilation invariant uh, from any point on the boundary. Now, associated to these, you have a hierarchy of symbols. So you're going to have the zero symbol, zero sigma m of l. This is going to be at a point, so z zeta. So I'm thinking of z as being x, y, and zeta as being c eta. And the symbol up to factors of i, which I'll get wrong, is the sum j plus mod alpha equals m. Uh, I'm going to have a j alpha of x and y, and then c to the j, uh, eta to the alpha, right? So this is the zero symbol. And what I'm doing is I'm replacing x dx by c and x dy by eta, right? Unlike in the normal symbol where I just replace dx by c and dy by eta, okay? Now, you might think, well, that's kind of very ad hoc and tied to this coordinate system. Just like with the ordinary symbol, where you can define this in local coordinates, it actually has an invariant meaning. It turns out that this has an invariant meaning. I could define this without use of any coordinates whatsoever as a polynomial on some vector bundle. In the ordinary symbol case, it's the vector bundle, which is the cotangent bundle of, uh, of M. Here, it's going to be something which I'm going to call the zero cotangent bundle of M. Okay, so there's a natural vector bundle that's associated to this. It's spanned by dx over x, and so these are dyi over x. These are the natural c infinity sections of it. So even though they look bad, they look singular, they're actually the smooth sections of this vector bundle. So, you know, this is just a change of perspective. You say, this is a vector bundle, these are the smooth sections, there's a coordinate invariant description of this zero t star of m. This is a homogeneous polynomial on the fibers of this, just like in the ordinary calculus, okay? So, um, yeah, this, as I had mentioned briefly, I have emitted systems, you know, act operators between vector bundles, but we obviously want to consider those as well. And the only difference is that, you know, then you have endomorphisms here as well. And these things are matrices, if you like, in local coordinates. Okay, um, and so uh, full ellipticity. Means two things. One is that zero sigma m of L is invertible when C eta is non-zero. And then the second thing is a second operator, which I'm going to call N of L, which I'm about to define, is also invertible. So this N of L is the boundary symbol, if you like. So now, how to define N of L? Well, I can give you sort of a uh, ad hoc definition. Well, I can give you two definitions, one um, using this dilation action and the other in terms of, I haven't done the blow-ups yet, but I'm going to do them momentarily. So one definition is, so I look at this family of dilates, right? Now, what, what is this doing? Now, again, I'll leave you to figure out whether lambda or one over lambda or whatever, but what this is doing is it says, I have this curved manifold, I've introduced this coordinate system, then I start blowing it up. I dilate, so blow up in a different sense, right? I'm just dilating the hell out of it. And this is converging as I dilate to a half space. I have this variable coefficient operator here, and what happens as lambda, well, in this case, goes to zero, what's happening is that this neighborhood is blown up to the whole half space, and the operator, L, based at that base point here, which maybe I'll call P, this has gone to something which I'll call NP of L, which has this local coordinate description, AJ alpha of zero comma, well, let me say P, this is zero in local coordinates, so P is equal to zero, zero in the local coordinate system, that's the base of the dilation, times X dx, to the j, x dy to the alpha. These are dilation invariant vector fields. But here, x and y, well, over here, they were living just in a neighborhood. They were local coordinates, C infinity coordinates. Here, x and y live in a half space, Rn plus. Okay? Now, just to avoid confusion with local coordinates, it's more customary to write this as, let's say, SDS and SDU. Okay? So, in fact, just to confuse you here, I've just changed the names of the coordinates, but what these... Uh, local coordinates have done is, in the limit, they've become dilation invariant coordinates. Okay? Excuse me. In the, they've become linear coordinates on this half space. Okay? How well defined is this? Well, if you do a change of variables computation, you will find that 
If you chose a different local coordinate system, you'll get a different S and U, and they vary by an affine transformation, which preserves the origin. So this is actually affine invariant. So S and U could be dilated. You could be, well, you know, so I'll leave you to work it out. You could, you know, it's, there's an upper triangular matrix, which relates one to the other. So in other words, you know, what's the diffeomorphism group which fixes that point? Well, it's diffeomorphisms which fix the boundary, which fix the point. What's the infinitesimal version of that? It's shearing matrices, right? It's matrices which fix the origin, and they might shear in that direction. So this is well-defined up to such linear transformations. And that, of course, reflects the fact that this operator is dilation invariant in S and U, and it's translation invariant in U. Okay, so those are the full set of symmetries here. Okay, so full ellipticity means that the interior symbol and, the, and this boundary symbol, which is now an operator, both have to be invertible. Okay? And the pseudo-differential calculus is supposed to be some mechanism that says, I take those two types of inverses, the algebraic inverse for this, which then I quantize via the Fourier transform, and the analytic inverse for this, and I kind of strap them together somehow, and those give me a good parametrics for the full operator. Okay? And that's exactly what you do in the interior calculus. It's just that you only have this step to deal with in the interior calculus. Okay, so now the, what we did was we passed to from M, we passed to M2. This is, uh, so the, the parametric G tilde is supposed to live, at, well, it's supposed to be a distribution on M2, M cross M. But then we saw that we really want to pass from M2, which is M cross M, to m20, which is m cross 0m. This was equal to the blow up m2 the boundary of the diagonal. And this leads us to that picture that we talked about endlessly yesterday. So we form this new geometric space. On this space, we just now define a space of suited differential operators, psi 0 star star of m. And by definition, this is the set of all operators A, such that the Schwartz kernel, K sub A, actually, now, this space here comes equipped with a natural mapping. So I did a blow up. I can undo that blow up to just map down to this space here. So this is beta. This is x, x tilde, y, and y tilde. This is just m cross m here. This is m squared. So there's a blow down map, which just collapses this front face. OK? And so what I want is that. Any pseudo-differential operator here is something whose Schwartz kernel naturally lives there, but it actually came from something up here. Okay, so this kappa sub a is actually uh, well. Let me write it this way: beta pullback of kappa sub a is equal to kappa lower k sub a is kappa lower sub a. This kappa sub lower a is a distribution. Well, let me say it much more clearly: it's a distribution which is polyhomogeneous on M two zero. But then it has this extra diagonal singularity. So I'm just inventing notation on the fly, but I'll tell you what this means. Okay. Well, this part is not on the fly. This part is a little bit ad hoc. Okay. So what I'm saying is that the distribution that this comes from, so this is just the push forward of a distribution here. So there's a natural push forward map or a pullback map. They are adjoints. Andras asked me to say that because people have been talking about pushbacks and pull forward, and pull, pullbacks and push forwards, and they're just adjoints of one another. Okay. So I can take the distribution down here, pull it back up here. It has this particular property. What is this class of distributions here? So this is So this kind of more thoroughly answers a question that Ellen asked yesterday. So I'm going to define a, uh, several classes of distributions on a manifold of boundary. So here's M, this manifold of boundary. I'm going to first start off with the space A of M. This is the space of conormal functions or distributions on M. So these are the set of U which have stable regularity. So let me say it coordinate free and then let me say it in coordinates. Stable regularity with respect to VB of M. So VB is like this V0 up here. I have a structure of vector fields. This is a slightly larger class of vector fields. VB is equal to the vector fields, which are so smooth vector fields, which are tangent to boundary M.
Okay, so this is equal to the span over C infinity of x d by dx and d by dyj. So notice I'm just doing one innocuous thing. I'm emitting the factor of x in front of there, right? That's a smaller class of vector fields. These guys are tangent to the boundary. The normal part has to vanish because they're tangent, right? But there's no x in front of there. Okay, so when I say that something is a stable regularity, so what I'm saying is that u is conormal means that, well, I can choose any reference space you like. Take your favorite function space, and you just say, u lives in that function space. Let me just call it uh, E to be very non judgmental, right? And then if I take V1 through VL of u, that still lies in E for all L and for all Vj in Vb. Okay, so all it's saying is that this space has the property, this, this space of A, uh, A of M is the set of things which have the property that you line some function space, and no matter how many times you differentiate with respect to this vector fields, you still lie in that space. Okay? Now, if I had the full class of vector fields, if I had d by dx and d by dy, this would just be C infinity. Right? And that's how you define C infinity. That's one way to define C infinity. You differentiate it a lot of times, and it stays no better, no worse. Right? So, now, typically, we might take E to be L2, or a weighted L2 space, or L infinity, C0, a weighted, you know, a weighted L, you know, whatever, holder space, whatever. So there's many possible choices here, but in some sense, they don't really matter. They're just different scales for the same thing. So this is our first guess at what are the smooth things on a manifolded boundary. And it's a pretty good guess, because this is a very natural class of vector fields, and, you know, it's, you're smooth with respect to those vector fields. Okay, so that's our first guess. Now, something that's a little bit closer to what we expect of smoothness, and one of the things that we know and love about smooth functions is that they have Taylor series. So, as we saw yesterday already, we expect Taylor series of some sort to play a role, and so we define a slightly broader class of things, which I call, or a slightly narrower class of things, APHG, so this stands for polyhomogeneous. So, here's a definition. So, it's the set of U's which are an A, so they're conormal. Did I write conormal? Yeah, I wrote conormal up there. And by the way, to tie this in with the more microlocal parts of these lectures, conormal means that they are Lagrangian distributions with respect to the conormal bundle of the boundary. So if you like that point of view, this is how to think about them. So, a, uh, so these are things which have expansions. So what I mean here is that um, there exist, for, so for all, for all n, there exist vector fields v1 through vn, Primed, let me say, there exists an n primed in vector fields which are in Vb such that V1, Vn primed of u lives in x to the n times L2, let's say. So you, let's say intersect L2, let's say this is A based on L2. So I let the, the function space be L2. Okay, so what I'm saying is L2 functions which are conormal, so I differentiate them any number of times with respect to these VB vector fields. And they have the extra property that for any fixed large integer, I can choose a particular set of VB vector fields which make these things vanish faster. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me decode that, because I'm saying something very simple in a complicated way, right? What I'm saying is that U has an expansion that looks like, so it might look like a X to the gamma zero U zero of Y plus dot, 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 plus x to the gamma n primed uh, un of y plus big O of x to the n. Okay? And in fact, I can allow slightly more general terms. I can look at x to the gamma j times log x to the l times u j l tilde of y or u j l of y. So these might be in here too. So I have an expansion which involves any weird complex powers I like. But they're getting positive. So what I need to know is that the real part of the gamma j's goes to plus infinity. And that for each gamma j, there's only finitely many log terms. So I don't want infinitely many log terms at a given polynomial weight. Okay? And these coefficients have to be smooth. Why does this mean the same thing? Well, precisely that if I have an expansion like this, so no matter how, so you know, the point is, that's why n primed and n are different. There might be many more exponents or many fewer than n. I have to kill off all of these. How do I kill off this guy? Well, I take x dx minus gamma zero. That's a VB vector field, right? It kills off this guy. Now, I could, of course, you know, I mean, this u zero of y has to be smooth precisely because this thing is conormal. I could differentiate with respect to any dy. 
right? So all of these coefficients are smooth, but I can kill them off one by one. Okay, so this is now better in the sense of this is more like C infinity. These are like Taylor series, right? They're not convergent, but these are classical expansions. Okay, so where were we? We were over here. What I'm saying is that on this manifold with corners, I'm polyhomogeneous at each of these faces. Now, the specific question that Alan asked yesterday, I guess, was um, what, do you, what do I mean by that at the corner? And what I mean is you have product type expansions. Or I can redo these definitions invariantly. I can talk about normal vector fields on a manifold with corners. Right? So these are just things which are tangent to all boundaries and corners. I can look at things which are stable regularity with respect to those. So I have conormal distributions on these things. And then I can talk about things which have expansions that can be killed off by, you know, finite, you know, same definition, finitely many of these VV vector fields. So the very specific thing that you're trying to avoid, so let me just say that clearly if I have, let's say, a corner, if here is x1 and x2, then my uh, vector fields are, you know, x i d by dx j. These are tangent to all boundaries. Okay, and uh, so if I have a function, so if u has an expansion, it might look like, you know, a i j x1 to the gamma i x2 to the mu j, something like that. That's allowable, possibly with finitely many log terms. What I don't want, so that's okay, but what I don't want is something that has an expansion in terms of r, r to the, you know, p, where uh, r is equal to root x1 squared plus x2 squared. Okay, so that's not okay. That doesn't fall, that's not in the product polyhomogeneous case. Okay, so polyhomogeneous are just, you know, things that are like C infinity functions, but they behave all their all boundaries. Okay, now, one of the uh, whole points of blowing up is that it could be in some problems that we'll see in a bit that you attain functions that look like they're good in polar coordinates. They're not polyhomogeneous on this space. So what do you do? You blow up. Remember, when in doubt, blow up. This is one of those times you're in doubt. So you blow up. There it is. And now it's polyhomogeneous. So if I take something polyhomogeneous here, if I were to blow it down, if I were to push it forward, it would not be polyhomogeneous here. And this is one of the cardinal rules. If I have something which is polyhomogeneous here, and I lift it under blow up, then it's just an easy, you know, all I'm doing is substituting x1 is equal to r cosine theta, x2 is equal to r sine theta. If I take something polyhomogeneous here and lift it, it stays polyhomogeneous. But on the other hand, if I have something polyhomogeneous here, it does not necessarily come from something polyhomogeneous here. So this is, again, an example. I take something which can be complicated here, and I make it simpler, make it polyhomogeneous, by blowing up. Okay? Okay, so the final bit of this notation so this diagonal is just to acknowledge that I have this singularity along the diagonal, which is a standard suited differential singularity, right? I could phrase it actually in terms of classical, conormal, or polyhomogeneous things along the diagonal. I won't do so just simply because you all learned about them in the past couple of days, okay? What does it do as I come down here? Well, the answer is it's behaving completely uniform. It's extendable across the front face, up to maybe a power of the distance function to the front face. So, you know, this is my class of operators. So I have things which are polyhomogeneous uh, with a singularity along the diagonal. And this is my attempt to quantize these operators, right? So I have differential operators with a certain dilation invariance. The answer here is that I have things whose Schwartz kernels live on this space. The fact of this blow up means that I'm sort of demanding this sort of kind of approximate homogeneity that I talked about. Okay, so to say that I'm polyhomogeneous up to this face is exactly that dilation invariance I talked about, or approximate dilation invariance. Yeah. So smoothness is certainly extendable. So, and again, polyhomogeneity is, you know, there's some sort of product type thing here. So I'm polyhomogeneous as I come here, and I'm extendable across there, so I'm sort of smooth as I come to that face and polyhomogeneous. It is poly, you know, in this sort of extended sense, is polyhomogeneous. Okay, good. Okay, so that's my class of objects, and I claim it's a big enough universe to do elliptic theory, right? And so the theorem which I talked about yesterday is sort of basically a consequence of defining this calculus and knowing about it. So what do you need of a pseudo-differential calculus? Well, first of all, what do I mean by a calculus rather than an algebra of pseudo-differential operators? Uh, what do you typically do with pseudo-differential operators? You 
compose them. That's one of the nice things about them. You can compose them. So one of the things I'd like to know is if I have an A which is in psi 0k, and let's say, so some index set here. So remind, the notation I used yesterday is E looks like E10, E01, E11. What these things mean are on this space, E10 corresponds to this face, E01 is here and E11 is here. These just tell you what exponents I get in the expansions in terms of boundary defining functions of these faces. Okay? So I need all this notation because I have three boundary faces. I have to tell you what exponents occur there. Okay? If I have a B which is in psi 0L, F, right? What's the most natural thing in the world that A composed with B should be in psi 0, K plus L, E plus F. Let me put a question mark, right? That's what I'd like to prove, right? Now, that's kind of true. It's not quite. And it's kind of true in the sense that clearly suited differential operators' uh, orders have to add, right? But E plus F, this needs to be modified quite, you know, substantially. And uh, I'm not going to go into the full details of this, but just to say that there is a rule like this, and the whole world, ca the word calculus, this is something that uh, Richard Melrose uh, popularized, if you like, um, or insisted on, or, you know, <laughs> whatever the point, is precisely to say that you, you cannot always compose operators. So it's not quite an algebra, right? So sometimes, depending on E and F, you're not allowed to compose. And it just has to do with some stupid thing that some power of the distance function is not integrable. So it's not any deep reason. It just means you can't integrate 1 over x squared, okay? So that's the only thing that obstructs us from being in algebra, is just that the orders of blow up or vanishing of these faces allowed by these expansions may be too big to integrate. Okay, so how would you prove such a theorem? So let me say, there are two things that you want. Composition, and the other thing is mapping properties. So you'd like to know if A is in psi zero, uh, K E, then A is a bounded operator, let's say from X to the delta, uh, well, let me just say L2, well, let me just say it more generally, H S sub E to X to the delta primed H, well, what do I expect? S minus K sub E, uh, zero, I'm sorry. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, these are Sobolev spaces which are based on the vector, so remember I have these vector fields, these structure vector fields, x dx and x dyj. I can define Sobolev spaces with respect to them, right? So if S is one, it would be the set of things which are in L2, so that when I differentiate them with respect to these vector fields, it stays in L2. If S is five, I can differentiate it up to five times. If F is three halves, I have to define it by interpolation or something. Okay, so I have the Sobolev spaces which are naturally adapted. There are Holder spaces which are naturally adapted to and which are better for certain nonlinear purposes, for example. But anyway, so I have various function spaces and I'd like to know, is A bounded on these? It certainly, it certainly should decrease regularity by K. It'll do something to the order of vanishing or blow up at the boundary. How do I predict? Okay, so there's a, a big tool and this was sort of one of the great um, uh, discoveries of Melrose is how to co codify both of these in a very beautiful and geometric way. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to say too much about this, but roughly speaking, you'd like to replicate sort of the old, you know, Hermander style composition, Co Nuremberg style composition laws for, let's say, doing part one, but that's really only handling the interior. So there's actually a very nice geometric picture that handles the, uh, the full story here. So let me draw a picture, and this is again an example of when in doubt, blow up. Right? So where is composition supposed to happen? So what I want to do is I want to define the triple space, m cross m cross m. Now, a, so if I think of a as a function of z and z primed, and b as a function of z primed and z double primed, then composition means I take a, think of it as a function of these two variables, I take b, think of it as a function of these two variables, multiply them, and integrate in z primed. Now, I wrote down what this means sort of functorially the other day, I'm going to have three projections, m cross m cross m, maps to m cross m in three different ways. There's the left projection, the middle projection, and the right projection. So I project onto these guys, I project off the middle, or I project onto the right double. Okay? What am I doing here? So let me write this in a fancier way. I take pi L pullback of k 
k sub a times pi r pullback of k sub b, and then I push forward with pi sub m. This is supposed to be the Schwartz kernel k a composed with b. Okay? All this is is some really stupid, fancy way of writing that. So if this is mysterious, just look at that. Okay? Now, really, these Schwartz kernels don't live on m cross m. They live on a blow-up of m cross m. So what the challenge is, is I want to see, can I make sense of all of this as uh, in the world of blow-ups instead of just on the world of m cross m? So what I really need is I need a space which I'm going to call m30, which is going to be equipped with three maps to m20. So this is going to be a blow-up of m cross m cross m. So I have to lose a dimension here. So here's, you know, x, x primed and x double primed. X, let me call x primed here and x double primed here. So I've lost the y variables altogether. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm taking something in the x and x prime variables, something in the x prime and x double prime variables, and then pushing it down. So I have sort of three spaces here. Everybody see what I mean? So here's x, x primed. Here's x primed, x double primed. So I take something here, pull it back, take something here, pull it back, multiply them, and push it down. Pushing down is just integrating over the fibers. OK, but the problem was that this space had blow-ups. These target spaces had blow-ups. So I need to blow up this guy in between. So what is this m sub 3 that makes all of these maps as well behaved as possible? Okay, so the answer is, well, I'll draw the picture. And here it is. It's a kind of a funny space. So I start with this guy. I blow up the origin. So again, I'm just doing, introducing polar coordinates at the origin, and I introduce the spherical face, r equals 0 there. And then I blow up each of the corners. Well, I'm really blowing up each of the diagonals of the partial diagonals of the corners there. So I'm going to get a picture that looks like this. OK, so pretty crazy picture. So I've blown up four things. OK, I have a bunch of bubbles there. So each of these are sort of given by introducing a succession of singular coordinate systems, like polar coordinates around appropriate submanifolds. Okay. And this face, so the three projections now, so this is sort of, this is M20, this is M20, and M20, the left, middle, and right guys. And the claim is, is that now there's a good map that goes to each of these things. OK, now what do I mean by good map? Well, in this world, there's a category of, of things called B maps. B stands for boundary and B submersions. And, and so the technical words, which I'm not going to say anything more about today, is that you have to create this triple space so that this is a B submersion. Each of these three projections are B submersions. OK, okay so I want to get back to this formula. Pulling back by B maps, in fact, quite generally, is easy to do. It's just kind of like I did in that illustration from a sector to, you know, blowing up r equals zero. Multiplying distributions. Well, that looks a bit dicey, but the wavefront sets. So this is just sort of the standard thing. And along the partial diagonals, the wavefront sets are disjoint. So I can multiply them. Okay? And then I push forward. It looks like I have singularities along all sorts of stuff. But again, the Hermander push forward theorem for wavefront set says that the only place where I'm going to have a wavefront set in the final thing is in the diagonal down here. So this thing really only has a singularity along the interior diagonal. But then what happens to all of this polyhomogeneity? So what is this theorem really saying here, this composition theorem is saying? Well, it says pseudo differential operators add an interior. That's the ordinary calculus of push forwards away front sets, multiplication of push forwards away front sets. And there's one extra thing. I start with kernels which are polyhomogeneous. So they have this very nice structure. I multiply them. That's easy to check that that preserves polyhomogeneity. I pull them back, multiply them. That all preserves polyhomogeneity. And then here's the big kicker. I push forward. I integrate along the fibers. That preserves polyhomogeneity. That takes a special property of mappings, and that's sort of the deep theorem here. So this is called uh, Melrose's push forward theorem. And it says, roughly speaking, the following, that if I have a polyhomogeneous distribution on, so let's suppose I have a mapping between two manifolds with corners, x and y, and it's a special type of mapping, one of these B submersions. Okay? If I have a polyhomogeneous function, and this is f here, 
So this is a B submersion. So it's a special type of mapping between two manifolds of the corners. So these are all, you know, these are all sorts of manifolds of corners. There's some examples for you. Okay, if I have a, uh, a polyhomogeneous thing on the domain space, then that maps to polyhomogeneous things on the range. Okay, so polyhomogeneity pushes forward. And the complicated thing is what happens to these index sets, these sort of keeping track of the indices which, which appear in the expansions. There's a rule which is a little bit complicated, and I'm not going to write it down. It's not very hard, but, you know, it's a bit complicated. Okay, so that's kind of the thing that makes it, that's the, the theorem that makes all of this work, is that if I take things which are polyhomogeneous on these blown-up spaces, multiply them and push them forward, it stays polyhomogeneous. That's the content of this composition formula. Right? I have this closed world of things, operators whose Schwartz kernels live on this blown up space in a particularly nice way. I compose them, they stay good. Okay? What is this composability criterion? Why was it a calculus and not an algebra? Well, when I integrate in this direction, so remember pushing forward just means integrating over these fibers. Right? And if I have the products of boundary defining functions being minus two, x to the minus two down here, I'm screwed. Right? I can't integrate. That's the only thing. Now, let me just say one word about B submersions. So, B, fib well, B fibra, yeah, forgive me, B fibrations, that's exactly what I want. So, this is supposed to be, so this is true if F is what's called a B fibration. So, forgive me, I misspoke. So, let me write down what a B fibration looks like. So, we're taking our simplest version of blow up. So, I start with uh, the sector and I blow it up. Okay, and then I'm going to do one more thing, which is I'm going to project down the vertical factor to the half line. Okay, so if you like, this is a half line, product of a half line with itself, and that blow up the origin. Okay, suppose I start with a polyhomogeneous thing here. So there's expansions here, here, and here. Okay, well, if I blow it down, I already saw that that actually may lead to problems. If I have something which is smooth in R, in the defining function here, I'm going to get something which is not product type polyhomogeneous at the corner. So if I have the function r, then that's going to give me something which is all scrunched up here. Okay? So it's not polyhomogeneous in this factor down here. But now suppose I push forward. It just means I'm integrating over these vertical fibers. Okay? What does that correspond to? If I forget this middle step, what I'm really saying is I take the mapping, which looks like that. And I'm, so here's this B fibration. So what a B fibration is is kind of a broken fibration. Okay? So in the interior, it looks like a nice fibration. But at the boundary, the fibers break up. Okay? But it has to do it in a particularly nice way, which I'm not telling you. And the claim is, is that when I do that, then everything is copacetic. Right? It works. So if I have something polyhomogeneous here, I push it forward by integrating over these broken fibers, I get something polyhomogeneous down here. So that's what this theorem is saying. So any, uh, any questions about any of that? So that's really the nuts and bolts of the theory. Now, I haven't talked about composition, but, you know, it's the same kind of crap. Yeah, there's stuff like that. that yeah, I mean, there's stuff that, like that that you have to worry about. That's exactly right. Now, the point is, is that if for any given operator, the image is always what it is. It lies in some weighted space. And if that weighted space is sort of, I mean, it depends what you mean by the domain of the second operator, because in principle you can feed in only things up to a certain growth rate. So that's really the issue. Okay, good. So, okay, everybody good with that? Okay, so this is the zero calculus. And like I say, this is just one very special case. This was something that was developed originally by Melrose and me a long, long time ago. And as Machek so well put it, I'm pretty bored of it at this point in my life. But, but no, it's a great tool, and people have done a lot of great things with it. There's many applications. And, uh, and I think it's a very cool thing. So, you know, I'd like to advertise, so why go through all this effort? Well, you know, I'm a geometric analyst more than a pure analyst or a pure geometer. And the point is, is that, you know, when you're working in interesting settings, in geometric settings, you want a good set of tools, right? So if you're on a compact manifold, then you can do any old damn thing, right? Uh, you know, pretty much anything works. But if you're on a manifold of boundary or corners, you have to, well, either you take the classical tools and you work really hard for no good reason, or you develop good tools that are adapted to there. And so that's kind of what I want to advertise this as is, you know, when you're in a singular setting, you want to have operators and 
you know, analytic tools which are specifically adapted to the geometry. And this is a particular way of doing this in a particular case. Okay. Okay, so in the remaining 20 minutes, I want to tell you about several other examples where that kind of methodology works. So, do I know the limits of this methodology? No. I mean, part of the reason why there's no great exposition on this is that, uh, you know, Richard in particular, but other people have tried to write expositions. And anytime you think, okay, I've got the story captured, you know, here's really everything, then there's always some really interesting case which falls outside of what you did. Okay, but the general theme is you take a space, you compactify it, you blow up stuff on the boundary, you define pseudo differential operators relative to that. So, you know, what can I say? It's a way of being, right? It's a way of thinking about things, it's a way of approaching problems, which you have to adapt to any particular situation. There's no hard and fast, this is what you do, you just follow these steps. If it were that simple, I'd be out of business. Okay, so let me tell you about several other examples. So, in a certain sense, this was kind of the second calculus that was developed. And Richard and I have been arguing for years, which is the more elementary, this one or the B calculus. And so let me tell you about the B calculus briefly. So it starts off the same way. I have a manifolded boundary, but the vector fields I use are VB. I already introduced them. So I start with VB of M. So this is the span of X dx and dyj. I take operators, which are sums of products of these things. So it looks almost the same as what I did. Except for there's a little, it's, they're a little bit less degenerate. Okay? Now, what are these? These are something that people have been thinking about in another guise for years. Right? So suppose I let log of x be t. Then x dx becomes dt. And this thing becomes, you know, aj alpha, uh, dt to the j, dy to the alpha. It doesn't look degenerate anymore. But the point is, is that whereas before I had, let's say, a manifold of boundary, there's m. What I've done is I've stretched the boundary out to infinity. So what I'm really looking at now is manifolds that goes out to infinity, right? These are manifolds with asymptotically cylindrical ends, okay? So all I'm doing here is taking a kind of a very well-studied class of things with asymptotically cylindrical ends, and I'm compactifying just by introducing e to the minus t is equal to x. Maybe I want minus log x. Okay, so that's a process of compactification. What does that buy for you? Well, a bit, in terms of regularity theory, it sort of clarifies various things. Um, and I want to point out just a couple of differences. Now, the point is, is that I can again do the same kind of stuff I just did, which is to say, I look at the symbols associated to this. So there's something called the B tangent and B cotangent bundles. There's a symbol, naturally defined, that tells you when I have interior B ellipticity. And then I have a boundary symbol. And to understand the boundary symbol, I can either do it by some kind of dilation or to something which I didn't say, again, in the zero calculus, but let me just say it. Now, if I pass to the double space, so what is, so in the zero calculus, what's the double space? Let me just remind you. So it's this thing that looks like that. A differential operator, a, B, a zero differential operator, so the previous class I was talking about back here, has the property that if it's differential, its Schwarz kernel lives right on the diagonal. It's a delta function on the diagonal. It's a delta function, it's derivatives, okay? When I talk about the normal operator, this sort of model, it can also be thought of as the restriction of that delta function to the front face. What do I mean by restricting a delta function to the front face? Well, it becomes a delta function right at that point. Well, what do I mean by that as an operator? Well, this thing, remember, looked like, projectively, it looked like a copy of the upper half space. This has a group structure. It's sort of a solvable group. If I compose, if I, let's say, convolve with respect to that solvable group structure, I have a delta function right here. That's just a differential operator. So it's just like, you know, if I take a differential operator, a constant coefficient differential operator, its Schwartz kernel really looks like a delta function along the diagonal. Okay? Well, this is the same story, except for I have a different group. I don't have the full translation group. I have this solvable group. Okay, the B calculus is a bit different. So the blow up looks different because I have one fewer degeneracy. So I have this. So what I do is I only blow up boundary M cross boundary M. I, I blow up the entire codimension two corner instead of a submanifold of it. So I start off with this and I blow up the entire corner. So the fibers are now quarter circles. So instead of being quarter spheres, they're just quarter circles. The, the diagonal looks like that. Okay? And what I require, 
What I require for ellipticity is that the symbol along here, the B symbol, and the restriction to this front face both be invertible. Okay. Well, this restriction along the front face is now an operator. So what I call this B operator, N of L in this sense, it's going to look like the following. A J alpha of 0 comma Y. Now, I'm only, this is global on the boundary. And this is the point that I really want to make. S to S to the J, dy to the alpha. Here, S is an R plus. So the only localization I've done has been in the normal variable, but not in the tangential variables. Okay? So here's this sort of model operator. This is sometimes just called the initial operator, but I'm using the same notation. This S is a global thing, and this lives on boundary of M cross R plus. Now, this operator is simpler than, well, I didn't write that, yeah, that operator, right? Why is it? Because it's completely translate, multiplicatively translation invariant to S. Okay? If I set T is equal to log S, this would just be constant coefficient operator in the T direction. So in other words, the model in this case looks like something which has a distinct better symmetry. So this model lives on, well, I can think of it as an R cross boundary M, right? So namely, there's an entire cylinder, and I take this model, which is just translation invariant in that T direction, right? Now, how do you invert something like that, or how do you study something like that? Well, that's much simpler than studying sort of this full curved operator, which is varying in X and Y. Okay? But the point I want to make is that it's still global in this cross-section. So I have this boundary of M. It's a compact manifold. And if boundary M weren't a compact manifold, this theory actually wouldn't work, at least without severe modifications. So I use global analytic properties of boundary M, take a constant, well, it's a suspension of boundary M. So I'm taking a product and taking an operator, which is, very, which is constant coefficient in that direction. And for example, I could Fourier transform in the T direction or Mellon transform in the S direction, what I'd get is this family of operators, A, J alpha of 0 and Y. Uh, let's call it tau to the J, dy to the alpha. Tau is a parameter. I can think of it as a complex parameter. Okay. So what is this thing? Well, it's an operator on the boundary M, which depends polynomially on tau. So this is called traditionally an operator pencil. And it's holomorphic properties in tau. So basically inverting this, which is the thing I want to do, corresponds, it's something like taking the inverse of a resolvent. So a special case might be tau squared minus Laplacian and boundary M. That's a special case of this. If I have to invert this, I'm just inverting the resolvent on the boundary. So why is this doable? Well, because I know everything about operators and compact manifolds, elliptic operators and compact manifolds, and then I have to extend it one stage up. Okay, is that hopefully clear? So, you know, there's kind of an inductive procedure here that I start off saying that the traditional calculus tells me everything about operators and their resolvents and compact manifolds, and that is the building block for what happens for these asymptotically cylindrical manifolds. Okay. Okay, so there's a big theory here, and the thing I wanted to emphasize, so it's been very useful for many things. Now, what's complicated the history is that manifolds with asymptotically cylindrical ends were discussed by, you know, uh, you know, Mazia and uh, Lockhart and McCohen and, you know, various people actually starting in the 60s in, in the Soviet literature and then um, sort of the gauge theory literature here in the 80s, uh, early 80s and so on. And the point is, is that if you're just doing sort of basic Fredholm theory on manifolds with, there it is, ma manifolds with asymptotically cylindrical ends, it's actually a really easy thing to do because people traditionally just separate variables in this thing. Okay? However, that doesn't give you the most refined information. It doesn't tell you a lot about composition on other than L2 spaces. And for the more delicate things that uh, Melrose and Tanya Christensen and you know, various other people did on asymptotically cylindrical manifolds, index theory, so Melrose discovered a very beautiful reformulation of the Atiyah Patodi Singer index formula, it really relies on this kind of operator framework. So namely, there are things that you can get by kind of ad hoc methods elsewise, and they just appear naturally as sort of part of the whole beast of, uh, of composing these operators and so on. Okay, so that's kind of an advertisement for why do it so you know, ornately, but um, it gives you a lot more information. Okay, so in the last 10 or 15 minutes, I want to talk about one last class of examples, which is, so I'm not doing anything that's really complicated geometrically. These are all pretty standard and classical things, but I just want to exhibit three rather different types of degeneracies. Um, so we talked about the zero calculus, the asymptotically hyperbolic geometry, the B calculus, which is asymptotically cylindrical, 
And then the last one I want to talk about is uh, asymptotic be conic. So this AC geometry. So these are spaces which are, again, very important in geometry and scattering theory. And an example is Rn, of course. So when I say it's asymptotic be conic, what I really mean is if I, all sorts of things can be happening down here. There can be some compact set with all sorts of complicated topology and whatnot. But out near infinity, it's looking asymptotically like, so this is a space mg, and asymptotically, it's looking like dr squared plus r squared h, where y comma h is a compact smooth manifold, Riemannian manifold. Okay, so in there, it's arbitrary, but as I go out, it's looking more and more like a Riemannian product, a Riemannian warp product, which is conic. Okay. And by this squiggle, I mean that it looks like this plus lower order terms. Ideally, what I really mean to get the finest results is if I let rho be, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, x be one over r, if I change that, I'm compactifying, I'm adding on infinity. So I now have compactified by adding on infinity, and what I'm starting to say is that all my objects are gonna be polyhomogeneous at that boundary. Okay, now let's write down what this metric looks like when I do that. So if I take x is equal to one over r, then dx, uh, dr is equal to minus dx over x squared, and I get the following kind of weird picture that g looks like dx squared over x to the fourth, plus h over x squared, okay? Looks bizarre, but it just looks like a cone in these funny coordinates, okay? So these are called scattering metrics. And the reason is because, and this was a paper of Melrose in the early 90s, which was later embellished by many, many people, and you know, it's led to sort of a very beautiful geometric theory of uh, Euclidean, you know, Riemannian scattering that generalizes Euclidean scattering. Uh, the point being that you see many geometric features of this operator H in the scattering theory. I'll tell you about a few of them. Okay, so if I think about it from the same point of view, what's the basic structural vector fields? Well, that geometry suggests that the structural vector fields are x squared dx and x d by dyi. These are the scattering vector fields. Okay. So why are these the good guys? Well, if you like, those are sort of the unit length smooth vector fields with respect to that, or you know, the bounded length smooth vector fields with respect to that metric, okay? If I were to take the constant coefficient vector fields on R, you know, just the constant coefficient vectors on Rn and invert them with respect to this polar coordinates, I'd get these, okay? So these are a really natural set of vector fields. Notice that these are closely related to the B vector fields, so I'm gonna write this as X times VB. So namely, if I take any B vector field and multiply by X, I get one of these. Okay, now let's tell this tale of three operators. So Laplacian plus one, Laplacian and Laplacian minus one. And my choice of Laplacian is, you know, the wrong one, uh, which is, so Laplacian is gonna look like, well, so roughly speaking, what should the Laplacian look like with respect to that metric? You know, X squared D by DX quantity squared plus x squared Laplacian h of y. So this is the model, and of course there are higher order terms, and you know, in general it's an elliptic combination of these vector fields. But I'm taking the plus sign here. So that's my error of my ways. So when I talk about the tail of these three vector fields, there is Uh, an interesting observation, that if I look at Laplacian minus, well, look at Laplacian itself. That's x to the fourth dx squared plus two x cubed dx plus x squared Laplacian h of y. And I notice that, well, if I'm just studying the Laplacian, I might as well pull out a factor of x squared. This looks like x squared times x squared dx squared plus two uh, x dx plus Laplacian h y. This is a B operator. This is an elliptic B operator. So all I'm doing here is the obvious fact that if I take a asymptotically conic space and I take its Laplacian at zero energy, in scattering theory language, it's just x squared times a B operator. And this explains why you see a lot of stuff done on Euclidean space by you know, reducing it to a cylinder, right? It's just that stupid change of variables. 
On the other hand, if I have a plus or minus 1 here, that doesn't make sense anymore. I can't do that. I can't pull out this factor of x squared from everybody. Okay, now there's a big difference between these two, and it's explained by the double space. So now the double space for this story is a bit more complicated. So I have two depths of, you know, I have two degeneracies. I have x squared dx and x dy. I have to get rid of both of those. And, you know, the rule of thumb is every time you blow up, you get rid of one degeneracy, one order of degeneracy. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is this b blow up. Okay, so that's just the space I introduced before, m sub b. And I know that this is not quite right because if I take this operator and lift it to here, I get something which still vanishes at the boundary of the diagonal. So that just means it's still degenerate at this level. So when in doubt, blow up. Right? So I pass, but now I just blow up the boundary of the diagonal. So now I get this sort of funny space that looks like this. So I've blown up this submanifold right here, which is the boundary of the diagonal. Okay, so I get this kind of weird looking space. So I have this hemisphere here. It's actually a blunt. Okay, hopefully that doesn't look too mysterious. So I've blown up the boundary of that diagonal. So I have this sort of submanifold, which is a, a bundle of hemispheres. The important thing is it stays away from these corners. Okay, and I can ask if I take this operator and I lift it first to this space and then to this space, what am I going to get? So there's a series of coordinate changes. So I don't have to draw these pictures. I could just draw, introduce a bunch of singular coordinates and you'd be in the dark about why I introduced them. But what they are are smooth coordinates on this space. Okay? So if I introduce a sequence of two singular coordinate changes, I'm going to reduce this operator, or these three operators, depending on 0, plus, or minus 1, I'm going to reduce these things to the following thing. x squared dx is going to get moved to something which I'll call d by ds squared. x squared Laplacian h is going to get moved to Laplacian on rn minus 1, and then plus or minus 1. Namely, if I lift this thing twice, it actually becomes an ordinary garden variety constant coefficient Laplacian on Euclidean space. Okay, so that's the normal operator in this setting. Okay, so two orders of degeneracy, and it localizes in the boundary. So something which I tried to stress here was in the B calculus, you're really global on the boundary. You can't sort of decompose the boundary into bits. The, uh, the expansions in the regularity theory you get depend on eigenvalues of boundary M. It's really global on the boundary here. Here, I do something that's global on the boundary, but then I do the second blow up, it's local on the boundary. Okay, so I get this operator, and that's the normal operator. And now, what does full ellipticity mean? Bound, the symbol ellipticity and then invertibility of this guy. Okay, well, that's invertible, but plus isn't. So there's a huge difference between Laplacian minus one and Laplacian plus one. Uh, so just to say what the parametrics looks like, you know, so I can define a space of pseudo differential operators which are polyhomogeneous at all boundary faces. And I find that that's too big for Laplacian minus 1, and it's too small for Laplacian plus 1. And let me say why, and I'll finish almost with that. So for Laplacian minus 1, what I'm going to get is if I invert that operator in this space, so I have the pseudo differential operator, which has a singularity along here. It has the inverse of this thing on here. And now the inverse of Laplacian minus 1 decays exponentially. Away, so remember, Way off diagonal behavior is very significant. If I take the Laplacian and Euclidean space, I go a long ways away from the diagonal, I have exponential decay. So what that means is that everything is vanishing exponentially as I go down this face to here. Okay, so this is kind of a, you know, remember this is really a manifold of boundary. Here's one boundary hypersurface, here's another boundary hypersurface, here are two more. Okay, so I have exponential behavior here, here, and here. So what that means is that the index sets, the polyhomogeneity is just gone. Everything's vanished, vanishing to infinite order. Okay? So I could have defined sort of this full polyhomogeneous calculus on this big blown, doubly blown up space. It's too big because I only need a very small bit of it to understand Laplacian minus 1. On the other hand, Laplacian plus 1 turns out to be a lot more complicated. So if I take Laplacian plus 1, I get polynomial decay here. And then it, actually this is, it turns out that there is here's the diagonal again, I'm going to have some sort of singularity here which is a little bit worse than polyhomogeneous. So the singularities for Laplacian plus 1 
are what you'd expect in scattering theory. Namely, you have something that's slightly, well, they're the boundary version of Lagrangian distributions. You have a Legendrian distribution here on that intermediate front face. So namely, the story is, you know, this polyhomogeneous expansion at all boundaries is not quite general enough for scattering theory. At this intermediate front face, the Schwartz kernel has a Legendrian singularity along here. Okay, and obviously that's a big story. This was originally worked out by Melrose and Swarovski and later uh, substantially furthered by uh, um, uh, Vashi and Wunsch. Uh, excuse me, Vashi and uh, Hassel and Vashi. Sorry, and Jared did something too um, later on, so Hassel and uh, Vashi. Okay, so that's, uh, that's sort of a, a more deeply analytic story of what you need. But that goes to show that you sort of think you have everything solved with this sort of polyhomogeneous story, and it's not quite good enough for that business. So that's just sort of the moral here. When you have zero, then it really reduces to a previous calculus. When you have minus one, it's much simpler than you think. And when you have plus one, it's much more complicated than you think. Okay. Um, I'm done. Uh, yes, certainly, and actually, Andras is much better positioned to answer that than I, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, so something that if I had five more minutes I would have said is, suppose you don't just have Laplacian, or Laplacian plus one, but you have Laplacian plus an n-body potential. Now, an n-body potential has bits out at infinity where it's big and where it's small. You have these channels going out to infinity. So you can compactify. So here's Rn. You have an n-body potential, and it's somehow big along various subspaces that go out to infinity. What do you do? You blow them up where it hits infinity. So you're going to sort of blow up these sort of, you get these sort of funny, you know, grooves at infinity that you've sort of blown up. And, you know, if you have a whole sequence of subspaces which intersect at infinity, then you have to blow up multiple times. So it's a very complicated story. But, you know, one of Andras's early, not his first success, but one of his early successes was really using this picture to sort of understand n-body scattering very, uh, very deeply. And, and so Legendrian distributions play a, a big role there. Higher end, so that's something that he and I did um, 10 years later. And so it turns out that, uh, well, I mean, he did the... Uh, Legendrian, but, but it turns out that also if you look at rank two, rank higher rank symmetric spaces or presumably locally symmetric spaces too, you're going to see that kind of, you know, these come about from some sort of propagation effect at infinity, which is what, um, you know, uh, Andras talked about and what um, was alluded to in several other lectures, and that happens in higher rank symmetric spaces too. And why? Well, it's precisely because you have Euclidean behavior at infinity as well as hyperbolic behavior at infinity. Excuse me? Yeah, so it's become, it's taking on more of a character of a Fourier integral operator. So the melrose worski theorem, in fact, was studying, not the, well, they were studying the resolvent, but they were really studying the scattering operator in these scattering metrics. And what they discovered was this very beautiful fact that the scattering operator, which in Euclidean space you know and love is sort of reflection plus a smoothing operator, in this case it looks like a Fourier integral operator associated to the geometry of H. It's, it's associated to the time pi geodesic flow of H. And uh, so you really have this propagation effect leading to a Fourier integral operator at infinity. And uh, that's somehow the root of this Legendrian distribution. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>